Didgeridoos, boomerangs, and an ancient hunter-gatherer lifestyle. These tend to be the first things to come to mind when we imagine indigenous Australians. Only with the arrival of the Europeans was agriculture introduced, but new research and old documents may reveal the secrets of native Australian agriculture. So, were the Aboriginals just hunter-gatherers? Did they take part in an ancient, secret whale-human alliance? And did they manage the largest estate on Earth? Well, let's find out. When the explorer Thomas Mitchell first travelled around Australia in the 1830s, he noted, We crossed a beautiful plain, covered in shining verdure, and ornamented with trees, which, although drooped in nature's careless haste, gave the country the appearance of an extensive park. It gives us a beautiful image of what the Australian wilderness would have looked like before the first European settlers arrived. Only, there's something slightly wrong with this image. It's false. False. Nature hadn't turned the country into a park. The indigenous people had. Depopulation by disease and the appetites of sheep has eliminated most of the visible evidence of native agriculture. So we'll have to heavily rely on the reports of early explorers and settlers to understand pre-contact agriculture. Andrew Todd, an early Australian settler, was left to guard the food stores at Indented Head, Victoria in 1835. In order to pass the time during this very boring assignment, Todd spent time with the local Watharong people. His sketches of their lives give us a small insight into Aboriginal agriculture. One sketch shows a line of women digging for morong tubers, a native yam, which is now almost extinct. The area where the women are working is perfectly cleared in a manner that would make harvesting much more efficient, in a similar manner to how modern farmers maintain their fields. Other explorers, such as Mitchell, noted similar behaviours elsewhere. At Cooper's Creek, it was documented that the natives reaped millet in fields of over a thousand acres, cutting down the stalks with stone knives. On the Arnhem coast, the parsnip yam was particularly important. When yams were dug out, the top of the tuber was left still attached to the tendril in the ground, so the yam would grow again. The fact that settlers report stuff like this over and over again shows that this wasn't an isolated technique. Cultivation wasn't a bug, it was a feature of Aboriginal land use. The Aboriginals had managed the land in a way that maintained the quality of the soil, through the use of burning down portions of the forest, planting trees in strategic locations, and harvesting crops in a way that did not drain the soil's nutrients. This process led early colonists like Edward Page to remark, When I first came here, I started a vegetable garden, and the soil dug like ashes. The constant stomping of newly arrived sheep and cattle destroyed the carefully managed earth and compacted the once soft soil. Now rains bounced off it, and rivers flooded higher than Aboriginals had ever seen. The Aboriginal methods of land management were not just practical, but also pretty. Clearing the land, planting trees in neat rows, and managing soil built that landscape that Mitchell described as an extensive park. There are so many of these examples of Aboriginals managing the land that Norman Tyndale was able to draw this map of indigenous grain areas, which stretched out across the continent. The native people would take seeds from one area and bring them to others where they did not occur naturally. They could trade them for other goods and services, as well as simply giving them as gifts. Selecting seeds and moving them across such distances over long periods of time slowly changed them, resulting in some of the plants taking on the attributes of domesticated plants. Thomas Mitchell stated, In the neighbourhood of our camp, the grass had been pulled to a very great extent and piled in hayricks, extending for miles, that had evidently been thus laid up by the natives. But for what purpose, we could not imagine. It wasn't until 100 years later that researchers figured out that the hayricks were being used to ripen the seeds in the grass, which were then collected, cleaned, stored and used to make bread. Through seed selection, precise planting and weeding, the Aboriginals created crops that thrived in Australia's harsh climate, like the bush tomato, used by the central desert people for thousands of years. It has become dependent on people for its survival and spread. Surplus harvests were rolled up into balls that could be stored for years. Professor Ian Shivers argues that in Australia we have stunning examples of very long-term grain food production that had no degrading impact on the environment, that did not require extensive fertilizers or pesticides, and grew without the need for irrigation water. 
The delicate science of baking popped up along with these harvests. We've discovered grindstones at Cuddy Springs in New South Wales that are over 30,000 years old, making the Aboriginals the world's oldest bakers. In the reed marshes near Swan Hill, James Kirby was intrigued by massive mounds dotting the landscape. From what he could see, they were emitting steam. He discovered that they were in fact gigantic ovens used for cooking. In this harsh land, the Aboriginal people produced a surplus, and surplus food production is one of the characteristics of agriculture. They had to take advantage of every niche possible in order to do this. They grew the nardo plant because it could grow in the beds of shallow lakes in otherwise inhospitable regions. As the lakes dried, explorers observed Aboriginals sweeping the seeds into huge piles and processing it into flour. Many explorers only barely survived their journeys after borrowing from these native stockpiles. John Davies, a member of one of the search parties for the famous Burke and Wills expedition, reported of the huge quantities of nardo seed he saw in the Sturzalicki Desert, reminding us that desert is really just a place where Europeans can grow wheat and sheep. Everything was preserved, from moths all the way to fish. Preserved caterpillars were made into a kind of flour, and figs and quandong were pulped and mixed into an edible paste. Large grain stores of more than 50 kilos were preserved in animal skins. The Aboriginals developed a system that allowed them to harvest from their environment without placing too much stress on it. This produced incredible results for them. Under this system, the Australian Alps became a huge food producer due to the summer arrival of massive numbers of Bogong moths. Clans such as the Manero, Bidwil, Nagarigo, Yuan, Tawa, Diringanj, Walbanga and the Nunganawal, which I have butchered all the names of, came together from across the continent to harvest these moths. Huge quantities of moths were collected from crevices in the rocks, captured with nets or swept up into kangaroo skins. The body was eaten or ground into a paste and made into doughy cakes which were then smoked to preserve them. Mmm, smoked moth paste, my favourite. Settlers, and I'm not joking here, described Aboriginals returning from the moth harvest with their bodies glistening with moth fat. When they weren't glistening with moth fat, the Aboriginals were using fire to manage their environment. Early reporters assumed that the burnings were a simple hunting method, but it appears that they were using the fires to create a section of cleared land and forest as part of a plan to maximise resources. They would position drinking wells between kangaroo zones and growing zones to provide all the needs for the animals, so that they would have no reason to enter areas dedicated to crops. They had created this kind of psychological fence. Fire controlled where the animals and trees would be, which made hunting much more effective and predictable, while at the same time keeping animals away from the crops. Within years of the Aboriginals being prevented from burning, the countryside was overrun with weed species. What had once been attractive pasture transformed into shrubland in a matter of years. You see, the settlers disliked fire. It threatened their houses, their cattle and their crops. But it was this careful use of fire that made the land so attractive to them in the first place. By constantly managing their environment, the Aboriginals built up a deep knowledge of the plant and animal life around them, and they used this knowledge to their advantage. For example, there is this incredible traditional whaling story recorded by the ethnographer Robert H. Matthews. When the natives saw a whale being chased by killer whales, one of the old men would pretend to be weak and slow to make the killer whales feel bad for him, and then the man would call on the killer whales to bring the chased whale ashore. When the injured whale drifted onto the beach, the other men came out of hiding to kill the whale. This ritual with killer whales encouraged the whales to chase even larger whales ashore, where they would be harvested by the Yun people, who would then share the feast not just with the neighbouring clans, but also with the killer whales, who would receive the tongue, which was apparently their favourite part. Whether there was an actual connection between the people and the whales is up for debate, but it appears that the Aboriginals understood how to constantly turn their fragile ecosystem to their advantage. This continued up until European whalers began to hunt and harm the whales. This severed the ancient human-whale alliance, but prophecy states that a child will be born of both races that will one day reunite our broken worlds. Their alliance with the whales wasn't the only aquatic achievements of the aboriginals. They were also experts in aquaculture. Thomas Mitchell witnessed massive fish traps on the Darling River, at Briwarina, 
Some claim that these are the oldest man-made structures on Earth. The rocks surrounded pools across a great distance. Fish were then herded in through the small openings which the natives would then shut with another rock. The pools are at different heights so they can be used when different water levels occur, making them resistant to the area's frequent floods and droughts. Quite how old these structures are is unclear. Locals claim that they are over 40,000 years old. In a 1984 survey, Jeanette Hope and Gary Vines said, The traps were most likely built during a period of a low water level, sometime between 19,000 and 3,000 years ago. Either way, they're super old. Upon seeing similar stone arrangements at Lake Conda, George Augustus Robinson remarked, An immense piece of ground trenched and banked, resembling the work of civilized man, but which on inspection I found to be the work of the aboriginal natives. His findings didn't gel with the early colonists who wanted to see the natives as nomadic barbarians. So it was either ignored or seen as evidence of irrigation by a superior, ancient, white and now lost race. Heavy rains in 1977 revealed how Aboriginal made channels fed water and eels into natural depressions termed holding ponds. In addition, a number of stone structures, possibly villages, were recorded in the same area as the fish traps. So if these were a fishing system and some stone structures located nearby were houses, then according to archaeologist Heather Bilth, then around 10,000 people lived a more or less settled life in this town. If such large populations lived there, then the demand for food would be incredible. They must have preserved it all somehow. Bilth turned to the hollow trees nearby. She could see immediately that these had all been used as fireplaces. And an analysis of the soil at their bases revealed eel fat. The local Gundijamara people assisted her the entire way. They knew all along what these structures were, but had never been asked. Together, they came to the conclusion that the traps were about 8,000 years old. Indigenous Australian religion prescribed that people leave the world as they found it. Each family cared for its own ground and knew how fire affected each species, along with each animal's connection to the Aboriginal dream time. They had a deep knowledge of every inch and knew well the lands of neighbours and other nations, sharing larger scale management and preservation of the land. They travelled to and from managed resources and made them not just sustainable, but convenient, abundant and predictable. They understood that the life of the clan relied on the quality of the land, which caused an underlying conservationist mindset, a concern for future people they would never meet. By re-examining how we view the Aboriginal people and how they manage the land, it can help us think of new solutions to how we currently manage our resources. Ironically, by shaping the land carefully for grazing animals, they pave the way for colonists. The more carefully they managed the land, the more attractive it looked. Their methods made it appear to Europeans that the land wasn't used, when in fact it was a nearly completely man-made environment. The Aboriginals didn't farm in the same way as the people of Africa, Eurasia or the Americas did, but the people currently living on the continent should be thankful that they didn't. The way they managed the land allowed it to be fertile for over 40,000 years. In the last 200, Australia has lost more than 50 animal and plant species and recorded the highest rate of mammalian extinction in the world. Luckily, we still have a people and a continent to learn from and work with. Hopefully, in the following years, we can learn more about the Indigenous Australians and how they groomed a continent-sized park. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can leave a comment if you did or if you have any questions regarding the video. All the sources used are in the description down below. You can also support the channel through Patreon and follow me on Facebook, Twitter or Reddit. All the links are in the description and it will be very much appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell on your way out and thank you so much for watching.